Hello, my name is Mary Hunt. I'm a feminist theologian, the co-director of WATER, the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual in Silver Spring, Maryland. It was my great honor on October 15, 2002, to deliver the inaugural Patricia A. Reef Memorial Lectureship at the School of Religion, Claremont Graduate University, Claremont, California. I'm asked by the committee now, in 2021, to make a recording of that lecture. Apparently it was not recorded at the time, but this recording will make the series complete by providing uh, audio and visual recording of my initial Pat Reef lecture. It's entitled Feminist Spiritualities, The Justice Connections, and I read it today on the 8th of January 2021, and I read it in Silver Spring, Maryland, scant seven miles from the White House, which has just suffered an enormous uh, problem of mob insurrectionists incited by now President Donald Trump, who attacked the Capitol building on uh, Wednesday of this week, on the 6th of January, 2021. Dates that remain uh, vivid, I think, and will remain vivid in the history of Americans for generations to come, January 6th, 2021. And now on January 8th, two days later, in the sober aftermath of this terrible experience, I read about feminist spiritualities, the justice connections from 18 years ago of my own work, and I wonder what I would say now if I were asked to deliver such a lecture. I wonder how my perspective would be changed, not only by the most recent events of history, but the long years of effort the last two decades to bring about social justice and the justice connections through feminist spirituality. So I don't know how I would uh, redo this lecture, but that's not the task today. Today the task is to make it available to the committee so that the entire uh, collection of these Pat Reef lectures will be available. So I do that today. Again, deeply honored to be part of the series and uh, ever grateful for the legacy of Pat Reef. And so I begin the Pat Reef Memorial Lecture, October 15, 2002, Claremont, California, Mary E. Hunt, lecturing on feminist spiritualities, the Justice Connection. I'm honored and humbled to inaugurate the Patricia A. Reef Memorial Lecture Series here in Claremont. Let me express my warm appreciation to Pat's colleagues and family, especially to her Immaculate Heart community and Immaculate Heart alumni as well as to her friends who established this lectureship in her memory. I'm also grateful to Dean Karen Torgerson and the staffs of the Claremont School of Theology and the Claremont Graduate University for gracious hospitality. This lectureship is a fitting tribute to her dual and complementary feminist commitments to scholarship and social change. It assures that there will be occasions like this to discuss and debate topics of urgent common concern. Then even those who did not have the pleasure of knowing Pat Reef will be touched by her justice-driven perspective. Let me begin with something about Pat Reef. Her spirit is certainly among us tonight as we consider the matter of feminist spiritualities, the justice connections, while the drumbeats of war sound in several parts of the globe. They are loudest, perhaps, in Washington, D.C., where the House and Senate voted last week to give President George W. Bush carte blanche with regard to Iraq. The vote would have given Pat Reef fits, as I learned when I moved to Washington more than 20 years ago. I lived then with several members of Network, the Catholic Social Justice Lobby, formed by nuns from several dozen congregations. When I introduced Pat to some of them on one of her visits, they said, Oh, we all know Pat, even though we have never met her in person. Her letters and calls to Congress members are the stuff of legend. Everyone knows Pat Reef. I came to appreciate the truth of that statement spoken by those sisters from Network. At least everyone who is concerned with peace and justice knows Pat Reef. And during the several decades that I worked with Pat through our respective centers, I too came to know Pat Reef. She led the Immaculate Heart College Center Master's Program in Feminist Spirituality beginning in 1984. And I've worked at WATER, the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual, in Silver Spring, Maryland since 1983. Water had just opened its doors and the Immaculate Heart College Center program 
was a nascent idea in the minds of some forward-looking feminist members of the Immaculate Heart community. When Pat came to visit me, and to consult on des course designs and bibliography. Ironically, I should have been consulting with her. In fact, we pooled our ideas and supported one another in our work for years to come, a collaboration I appreciated. Pat graciously invited me to teach the first course offered by the MA program in March 1984, entitled Introduction to Feminist Spirituality. I taught it three more times before she had the good sense to teach it herself. As Joe Kirkpatrick observed in one of the several obituaries written after Pat's untimely death in March of 2002, Pat's teaching was powerful. Ideas that, as Joe wrote, shifted your whole paradigm of thinking. That was Pat's goal, not just to convey content, but to rethink the ways in which ideas especially oppressive ones, could be reconstructed. What impressed me was that Pat didn't simply focus on feminist issues in religion. She chaired the Women's Caucus of the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature, but she also brought her enormous energy to anti-nuclear work, in support of women and of people in Central America, and for work on the Interfaith Hunger Coalition in LA. She brought a philosopher's rigor and a teacher's creativity to invite students and lawmakers, Catholic bishops and other recalcitrant souls to consider inclusive egalitarian modes of living because they made intellectual as well as moral sense. Pat lived simply, though she was painfully aware of life's complexities, unwilling to settle for simplistic answers no matter how politically important. Pat was a pragmatist, but she tempered her efforts with hope. I was privileged to be with her that incredible week in November 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell away. We watched it on television, Pat with a cigarette and a glass of wine of an evening. I wide-eyed at the fact that I had actually lived to see some semblance of justice. We admitted to each other that we believed that all things are possible. It was that attitude and her beloved game of tennis that kept Pat centered and pleasant in a business that can lead to burnout, cynicism, and despair. After all, being a non-lobotomized feminist Catholic woman, a U.S. citizen who hates war, and a citizen of the planet who wills its well-being and the well-being of all of its inhabitants is a challenging assignment. I will miss this wise friend and compañera and I know many of you miss her as well. My only consolation about her early death is that she's not living long enough to endure the current pedophilia scandals and Episcopal cover-ups in the Roman Catholic Church, nor to witness the $189 million cathedral complex, as the New York Times calls the new cathedral in Los Angeles. By all accounts, it's an architectural jewel a monument to agribusiness and dot-com prosperity. Shortly after the ceremonies that opened it, the largest Catholic archdiocese in the country announced a budget shortfall of $4.3 million. Their bright idea for covering this shortage is to close eight diocesan departments, including the Office of Ministry with persons with disabilities. The detention ministry, in a state that has one of the largest concentrations of prisons in the country the Archdiocesan Council of Catholic Women, Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs, the Ethnic Groups Ministry, the Office of Respect for Life, Campus Ministry, and Ministry with Lesbian and Gay Catholics. This alleged coincidence of bad market conditions and the opening of a pricey building, to say nothing of the role payoffs for sexual abuse play in the equation, results in a scandalous elimination of services that would have had Pat Reef on the phone, in the streets, and at her computer. I doubt that she would have felt that one cathedral wall, even if it lasts forever, is more important than visiting a prisoner or accompanying those with disabilities, providing an infrastructure for women's issues, or a place for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people to find spiritual nourishment. It's her commitment to social justice that is intimately connected to feminist spiritualities 
that I wish to focus on in this lecture in memory of her. I elected my theme carefully, afraid that anything less theopolitical would offend Pat from afar, and anything more pious would be an affront to her spirit. Pat's fear and loathing of nuclear weapons and war, her tireless work on behalf of people who are poor and marginalized, especially women and children, and her encyclopedic grasp of feminist work in religion were all grounded in an ever-deepening faith that began in early traditional Roman Catholicism. It eventually found residence in other religious traditions as well. I will keep to that same dynamic, a rootedness in my own Christian tradition as I critique some of what passes for feminist spiritualities, and an eye toward other traditions about which I know less and have correspondingly less responsibility. I'll leave it to others to fill in the gaps. Let me turn to my topic. Feminist spirituality was the theme of the Immaculate Heart College Center MA program that has now ceased operation, though it empowered hundreds of women during its existence. Thus the topic of feminist spirituality is dear to the hearts of many, a reality that I do not want to run roughshod over, but one which I think bears critical examination, lest it be co-opted along with so many other forms of progressive work in these especially difficult times. I want to explore the current landscape in the field in four necessarily brief aspects. First, feminist spiritualities as expressions of women's efforts to be religious agents. Second, the demands that, of justice that press upon those of us who live in the United States. Third, the connections or lack of them between feminist spiritualities and justice work. And fourth, the challenges that frame future work in the field, given what I will argue are certain incompatibilities between some forms of feminist spiritualities and contemporary requirements of justice. A recent New Yorker in October 2002, a recent New Yorker cartoon sums up my view. Two women sit in lotus positions on yoga mats. One says to the other, I just found an Eastern philosophy that's very accepting of SUVs. It conveys the vexed question of how to live with integrity as a feminist religious person in a world that rewards the very antithesis. So I turn first to feminist spiritualities ex as expressions of women's efforts to be religious agents. I've come to see feminist spiritualities as expressions of women's efforts to be religious agents. I deliberately connect something so seemingly personal as spirituality that has myriad expressions with something so seemingly political as agency, or as my Latin American sisters have suggested, protagonism. I do so to leave no doubt about the powerful connection between our deepest beliefs and our ways of articulating them that never seem to be adequate, but always have consequences. Whether through art or music, prayer or text, symbol or image, liturgy or meditation, games or meals, the very spiritualities we articulate are ways we make known that previous generations of women have largely been prohibited from expressing on their own terms. Of course, Hildegard of Bingen, Julian of Norwich, Teresa of Avila, and other exceptions prove the rule. But I think it's fair to say that ours is the first generation that has benefited from a widespread articulation of feminist sensibilities in spiritual terms. Feminist sensibilities in spiritual terms. Feminist biblical scholar Kwak Puilan, professor at Episcopal Divinity School, reports that Americans spent $230 billion on New Age spirituality in the year 2000. More than 70% of New Agers, she said, are women. Their average age is 42 and they buy an average of 21 books a year. The trend away from all but the most conservative religious traditions is growing. Spirituality is picking up the slack. By spirituality, I mean the ways in which we pay attention to and try to express our deepest connections and commitments. In all candor, I must admit I have long suffered a certain allergy to spirituality. Coming from the Roman Catholic tradition, 
I was taught that spirituality belonged to the mystics and to the saints, the nuns and the priests, the pious and the good. I fit none of those categories very snugly, if at all. Spirituality always reminded me of those prohibited sandwiches of peanut butter and marshmallow fluff on white bread that other kids' mothers might have given them after school. My mother knew that the sugar rush would pick us up and drop us just as quickly, and that white bread had no redeeming nutritional value. So we often got fruit instead. Patriarchal spirituality is like that awful sandwich, a useful and effective distraction that makes one feel good as one taps into the transcendent and unites with a community of seemingly like-minded people. But then comes the awful letdown, that the price is a deeper co-optation by a religious system that finally prohibits people, especially women, from exercising any meaningful agency whatsoever. For example, in my tradition, the Eucharist has become contested territory since women cannot be ordained as priests. Thus, the very heart of the sacramental system, not merely the governance on which the church is based, and of course is left to ordained people as a privilege, but the very heart of the sacramental system, the Eucharist, the very experience meant to unify and nourish, is fraught with contradiction and oppression as women are left aside. I think of certain Presbyterian wranglings over homosexuality that produced a similar contradiction in their members and realize Catholics are not the only ones with this problem. That spirituality is shaped by those in power is not a new insight. It is, in fact, spirituality shaped by power. It is that Rosemary Ruther, Mary Daly, Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza and others tried to help us to understand in their various ways beginning more than 30 years ago how this dynamic works. Harvard Divinity School's November 2002 conference looking at the implications of feminist work and religion for the women's movement promises a cogent analysis of the remarkable contributions feminists have made to religion and that feminism is making to the larger society, whether it wants it or not. The many feminist spiritualities that have developed since then represent the range of ways women attempt to exercise agency. And by since then, I mean since the early work of feminist theologians beginning in the 1950s and 60s. More recently, Professor Diana L. Eck, in her work on religious pluralism, A New Religious America, How a Christian Country has now become the world's most religiously diverse nation. In that book, she makes clear that the hallmark of 21st century religion in the U.S. is, in fact, its pluralism. What was once a three-religion culture, she argues, is now a multi-religious landscape, with more Muslims than Presbyterians and literally scores of faith traditions competing for our allegiance. In most of these groups, women seek expressions that are consistent with the rest of our efforts to live as full human beings in a culture that resists our efforts mightily. Witness the Equal Rights Amendment that never passed, or at least hasn't passed until now. The U.S. failure to ratify the United, the United Nations Convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. And think of the continued assault on reproductive rights, and you see how wide the gap is between spiritual empowerment and social change. Especially for poor women and women of color, incarcerated women, the very young and the very old, the much-touted achievements of some women in the professions, our right to vote and hold political office have not created equality for all. Nonetheless, the insight of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and other suffrage leaders that without substantive changes in religion, there would be no deep structural changes in society remains correct. Even with religious changes, social shifts are slow and backlash dominant. At a minimum, I believe we must acknowledge that the feminist spirituality that undergirded Pat Reese's program is now a plural concept. I suspect that Pat would have delighted in renaming her program to reflect the myriad ways women both as part of established traditions and beyond them, seek to convey their deepest beliefs. This is a sign of success.
feminist spiritualities. Virtually every religious tradition has felt the impact of women's spiritual awakenings. For example, for example, Mormons and Catholics, Orthodox Jewish women, and Greek and Russian Orthodox Christian women have debated the matter of ministry and ordination. Never mind that it's usually low pay, long hours, low prestige, constant availability, a recipe for a woman's job in a patriarchal culture. But ministry is becoming an increasingly female field like nursing and teaching. The desire to exercise religious agency and structures that have restricted that to the ordained rather than to all adherents have made the struggle for ordination a logical and compelling one. As a Catholic, I have come to see that the structures that divide lay from ordained lie at the heart of the problem, even more fundamental, though not coincidental, to the matter of gender exclusion. The problem is lay and ordained. So I promote a rethinking of models of ministry rather than simply adding women to a system that prohibits any but a very few clerics from making decisions. The rejection of exclusivist leadership is part of a critical hermeneutic I bring to the matter of feminist spiritualities. There are phenomenal numbers of what I think of as women's spiritual freelancers, something that we once referred to as very California, but is now a widespread phenomenon. For example, the Washington National Cathedral, long referred to as the Republican Party at Prayer, sponsors a biannual weekend gathering. It's a weekend gathering of a large meeting of women called Sacred Circles with music and dance, arts and meditation, sacred stories and yoga, endless choices with seemingly little to do with the raging debates blocks away in the government. This troubles me even though I support the efforts at Women's Religious Agency. Do such practices really make the world substantively different? If not, are they adequate? I more than wonder as I scour the cathedral's program for some shred of evidence that there is more at stake than simply a pause that refreshes. Likewise, ancient prayer forms like the labyrinth are growing in popularity. They appeal to a sense of tradition. They don't require much verbal impact, input. They are inclusive and aesthetically pleasing. They get the job done. Walk and think and pray and stop and walk some more and exit. A beginning and an end. A time out to go in. I have found the labyrinth very helpful. It's very much a centering prayer. I always finish it feeling as if I've done my spiritual work. I'm unsure about it, unconnected to the persons behind and in front of me. It is of the nature of the experience that I'll never know what happens to them, nor should I necessarily. But I'm reluctant to endorse such spirituality, though I see it as part of the effort at agency, when the individualizing, privatizing, isolating dynamic so prevalent in our society is reinforced. I'm hesitant much as I enjoy the experience. I think my dilemma is becoming increasingly obvious. Many popular forms of feminist spiritualities seem to be disconnected from social change, which is at the heart of feminism. I seek to connect them rather than fall into the trap that would keep us praying while the bombs drop. Take the phenomenal rise in interest in Celtic spirituality, for example. You can buy bits of it in any music store or bookshop. Is it nostalgia or really a deep connection to ancestors and spiritual ideals? Mary Condren and other Irish feminist theologians take a dim view of any romanticization of their people who have struggled long and hard, especially the women, against the co-opting odds of hierarchical Catholicism and Protestantism's wordy input. I take them seriously, even if my enthusiasm for certain high-pitched Irish flutes and voices that resonate with my heritage. Stay with me. The crystals, altars, and tarot cards that are part of some women's efforts to express their religious agency. The massages and those oils, aura reading, and color therapy that express alternatives to a patriarchal worldview have their place. 
There are alternatives to a women's auxiliary in a male-led movement of whatever stripe. But how do these connect us? Religion's Latin root is religere, to connect or to link. How do they empower us to work to undo, just, to undo injustice together? The argument is that they empower individuals who then work for change. But I honestly don't see how they contribute much to the movements that make change. I've seen at Water what really connects people to religion is not, with all due respect to my own work in theology and ethics, that work, but it's liturgy and ritual. It's the sights and sounds, the tastes and smells of a religious tradition that nourish people. It's what happens when their mother dies or their baby gets sick, when they lose a job or break up a relationship. That's what really counts as real religion if someone pays attention. Thus, I'm increasingly critical of patriarchal religions that take advantage of people in their most vulnerable moments and or prohibit them from exploring other options that would better resonate with their spiritual needs. For example, the fact that Christianity has no celebration for women as they come of age or for women as we age has led to celebrations of first menses and croning celebrations in many feminist groups. But I find myself increasingly impatient with these allegedly feminist alternatives that do not make the justice connections either. While it's a step forward to create our own celebrations, if they are not conducive of justice through content and actions that empower, they could be a step backward. One may question the wisdom of such critique on the grounds that it may undercut the very efforts I seek to encourage. I would counter that without such critical study among ourselves, we can't develop constructive alternatives, and we may inadvertently replicate the dynamics we seek to escape. Two concrete examples drive my argument. First, I believe that feminist spiritualities can become a commodity, privatized and individualized, then bought and sold like everything else in this culture. For example, my feminist enthusiasm for witches as strong women, protagonists for sure, was dimmed considerably by a visit to Salem, Massachusetts. There, the commercialization of witch paraphernalia reminded me of tasteless Catholic shrines full of kitsch, or Bethlehem in better times when one could visit the Franciscan church on Milk Grotto Lane, where our Blessed Mother allegedly first breastfed our Blessed Jesus. Religions are not immune from such commercializations but I consider it a sure sign of their corruption, as much in feminist instances as in any other. When the sacred objects on the household altar outnumber the sacred people in the household community, I begin to get suspicious. I'm equally dubious of expensive spiritualities. While it's important to recognize the legitimate needs of religious leaders, if your guru is rich or your pastor drives a fancy car, it might be time to think again. Ministry and related religious work is a privilege when contrasted with digging a ditch or working in a factory. Granted, not many women get rich quick off feminist spirituality. But the point is to bring an economic critique to our efforts, lest they become exclusive. I say this with, at some peril, since I run a small nonprofit organization that is not always sure where next month's rent is coming from. But I know that the Immaculate Heart College Center MA program certainly didn't fold because it had too much money. Still, I believe that feminist spiritualities ought to be available to a widespread public, not simply to those who can pay steep tuition. This philosophy and getting rich quick are incompatible, given the unequal distribution of wealth in the world, as Water and Immaculate Heart know so well. Feminist religious professionals are professionals who deserve to make a living. But I respectfully submit that we consider cooperative rather than corporate models for building the infrastructures for our movements and for our organizations. That way we'll be sure that no matter how large or how small they may be, that those who have invested their own time and their own energy run the organizations and the movements. It's this switch from corporate board-driven to cooperative participant-run models that I think has the best chance
of keeping our organizations consistent with our commitments, as well as keeping them solvent. I acknowledge that this is not an easy matter, but when feminist spiritualities become private practices, it is a concern that loses priority. My second concern is that certain forms of feminist spiritualities can be seen as a distraction, a distraction from the fray, when in fact, in my mind, energy for, for the fray is what we get from spirituality. I think of spirituality as attention to choices we make about the quality of our lives and the lives of those with whom we share the planet. This implies that spiritual choices must be both personal and communal, both religious and political, both concrete and aesthetically pleasing. Decamp decoupling spiritual practices from political practices is an effective route to social stagnation, a good way to take up time, energy, and resources that could be put elsewhere. I do not mean to suggest that every meditation ought to be on an impending war, nor that every liturgy be focused on anti-racism work, but I do mean to claim that we can ill afford spiritual practices that add insult to injury and do not keep these vital efforts before us. Cultural scholar Andy Smith makes the point in her classic essay, For All Those Who Are Indian in a Former Life. It's in Carol Adams' edited volume, Ecofeminism and the Sacred, published by Continuum in 1993, pages 168 to 71, 171. Smith critiques white feminists who use and abuse Native American culture. She writes, and I quote, Moreover, they want to become Indian without holding themselves accountable to Indian communities, unquote. Andy Smith makes clear that however unconscious and well-intended, the use of talking sticks and sweat lodges can be offensive and colonialist outside their context. She concludes, and I quote, our spirituality is not for sale. Granted, every case is not as egregious. But I wonder if in some of our efforts to leave behind the faith of our fathers, we have not thrown the baby out with the baptismal water. Let me be clear that I'm not suggesting a return to patriarchal religions, nor providing cover for those Falwellians who would condemn all feminist theological ventures as heresy. To the contrary, I seek to bring the same rigorous and far-reaching critique that distinguished Pilgrim Place residents Nell Morton and Anne McGrew Bennett, who brought well, it's the critique that they brought to the language and imagery and symbolism of Christianity 30 years ago that I seek to emulate. Recall that they were not content with a gender analysis. Rather, they added a, a wide-ranging analysis of oppressive structures, what Elizabeth Schuessler Fiorenza has helpfully called curiarchal, structures of lordship, interlocking forms of oppression like sexism, racism, colonialism, heterosexism, and economic injustice. Feminism is no longer about gender exclusivity, if it ever was. It's a serious grappling with the complex and often pernicious interstructuring of ways in which some people are privileged and others are oppressed on the basis of racism, economic access, sexuality, nationality, and the like. 21st century feminist spiritualities must reflect this complexity in their analysis and strategies for change in order to be helpful in justice struggles. While I'm reluctant to threaten labels, I honestly wonder whether much of what passes as women's spirituality can really be called feminism or feminist, since feminism or feminist are not neutral on matters of justice. The second area I want to look at is the demands of justice that press upon those who live in the U.S. When I reflect on the enormous changes that have characterized daily life in the 30 years that feminist theologies have been on the religious scene, I'm struck by the contrast between our efforts and our achievements. On almost every level that one can claim enormous progress, medicine, education, food production, commerce, enthusiasm must be tempered with the fact that advances are available to some, but not to all. To some, but not to others. This is the nature of globalization, 
where more and more decisions that affect the lives of everyone are made by fewer and fewer people. Hence my concern for our being agents of spiritualities that affirm diversity while prioritizing the need for equitable sharing. This is what it means to address the demands of justice on those of us in the United States in the 21st century. The tools of globalization are amazing. For example, who would have predicted relatively inexpensive air travel, cheap telephone service, computer and internet technology that have changed the ways that we live and work, genetic advances that make, pre, make preventing and are curing certain diseases a realistic possibility in our lifetime. Who would have imagined these? Still, the events of the last year make clear that people in other parts of the world rightly reject the hegemonic power of the U.S. where corporate wealth is commercialized and concentrated, political muscle flexed, and military might worshipped. Let one tragic example suffice to make the point. HIV AIDS that began as a northern western white gay male phenomenon has now morphed into a mirror of poverty and marginalization put up in front of the world affecting women of color, their dependent children, and others who are marginalized with increased frequency. While tens of millions have died and tens of millions more are infected, the disease is literally a death sentence in South Africa and in Botswana, while it has become a somewhat manageable chronic illness for many with health insurance in the United States. We have only seen the tip of the iceberg as India and China with their huge populations, show signs of widespread HIV AIDS infection. Yet it is U.S. pharmaceutical companies and the U.S. government with its foreign aid policy that keeps much needed condoms from people around the world, withholding keys to health for hundreds of millions of people. I submit that few U.S. citizens reflect on this when they vote and pay taxes. You can be sure that Pat Reef reflected on these questions and the heroic protesters against the World Bank and International Monetary Fund have these issues on their minds. But in jaded Washington, D.C., I hear not-so-veiled whispers about how few they are and how anachronistic this generation of protesters has become. After all, this is a time when the markets are heading south and the threats of higher gas prices over hang overhead a car-driven society. U.S. leaders already have a post-war plan on the drawing boards, in case you wonder if there'll be an invasion. Since that is accomplished, there's not room, until that's accomplished, there's not room on Bush administration's plate for any critique. This is precisely why religious, religions and spiritualities are so important, because they serve as the bedrock of society's values and commitments. Note that I connect religion and spiritualities though they, of course, are technically different, rather than disconnect them, as many scholars do. I believe the separation serves those who would also disconnect social change and religion. An important task in a pluralistic society like ours is to find ways to live with our differences. But another task is to find ways to bring our similarities into view so that we can help to shape our common project rather than letting business and industry, the military, media, and government do the job alone. One role of religion has always been to provide an alternative worldview. In this case, a horizon over against which to measure and denounce injustice. It's because our faith traditions teach us the dignity and worth of each human being that we say that racism is wrong, that sexism contradicts the common good, that economic disparities are indefensible, that nations have the right to self-determination. Feminist religious efforts share this prophetic task. When these same traditions teach otherwise or abdicate the teaching function, we have real trouble. Case in point, Jerry Falwell's charge that the great prophet Muhammad was a terrorist, resulting in riots in India where people died. I do not mean to suggest that feminist spiritualities do not engage such questions, uh, that do not engage such questions cause deaths and destruction. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I would go so far as to say 
but a time when we need all religious allies we can find. Such things do not help. To put it positively, the challenge for religious feminists is to put our increased influence in the service of justice making. To put our increased influence to the service of justice making. How we do this will vary, but that we must do it seems determined by globalized forces arrayed against people who are poor, especially women and children, as well as against the environment. Indian scholar activist Vandana Shiva warns that future wars will be fought not over land, but over water. Water is already a scarce commodity in many parts of the world, an oft-wasted resource close to home. This concerns us at water, and hopefully it concerns all justice seekers. The third area I want to look at is how then do we analyze the connections or lack of them between feminist spiritualities and justice work. How do we analyze this relationship? I say in a word with great caution, lest I offend a favored practice or discourage someone from engaging in what ethicist Daniel C. McGuire called the renewable moral energy of religion. The renewable moral energy of religion. It's a great phrase from ethicist Dan McGuire. It's that effort that takes place when we deconstruct and reconstruct our traditions. Feminist scholars in the academy, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Pagan, Wiccan, Muslim, and Christian, have been doing that for decades. This kind of political praxis is simply one kind, but it is political praxis. It has not given sufficient attention to concrete consequences, but it makes me wonder how then we can call it feminist unless we attend to those consequences with great detail. Rather than rail against the negative, I will point out some examples of groups, organizations, individuals, and practices that articulate what I call the justice connection, leaving aside those that don't. My examples are by no means exhaustive but they suggest some criteria that might be useful for evaluating other efforts. It's crucial that we have a working definition of feminism in order to understand my analysis. It used to be that feminism had to do with women's well-being in a patriarchal culture. But given that that same patriarchal culture is racist, colonialist, heterosexist, and economically unjust, Feminism now implies a broadly based analysis and the strategies that go with it to eradicate structures and behaviors that discriminate. As such, feminism is not limited to women, nor even to those who identify their commitments. Womanist, mujerista, and other such choices are of course integral parts of the same work. Feminist work is part of diverse efforts to create justice. I begin with a happy example, that of the Resource Center for Women in Ministry in the South, led by Jeanette Stokes in Durham, North Carolina. The center is best known for their quarterly newsletter, South of the Garden, and their useful email calendar of programs happening in feminist spirituality around the country. The, center, the Resource Center for Women in Ministry in the South recently celebrated 25 years of faithful work, empowering women ministers and others. Their festive gathering featured a labyrinth, a healthy potluck dinner, music, prayer, the launching of Jeanette Stokes' new book, 25 Years in the Garden, a compilation of her uh, newsletter articles. It included dances of universal peace and explicit references to the global injustices we seek to transform. Truth in advertising, I was their after dinner speaker. Everyone was welcome, uh, there was bread as well as roses. Justice took no backseat to festivity, nor vice versa. The event reflected the commitments of people who've been, who have worked long and hard with a spirituality that matches their politics. That night, we went away feeling well-fed in body as well as in soul. It's an example of what can be done quite simply, albeit in small groups, with attention to beauty as well as politics. Spirituality must be enjoyable, or it will not be sustained. Contrast this with the glitzy benefits you've been subject, subjected to, that make of one of the most popular fundraising in, in, uh, that make 
one of the most popular fundraising invitations in some circles, those that invite you and make a donation in order to be able to stay home. Yes, those glitzy dinners are rather boring. We'd rather pay not to go. Another wonderful example of the combination I'm promoting, though is not perhaps as explicitly feminist as it might be, is the use of meditation for social change. One place I can recommend personally is Rancho Vallecitos outside of Taos, New Mexico. It provides a refugee program for social justice activists, teaching insight meditation at 9,000 feet, where people live in casitas and yurts without electricity. I found it something like Buddhism light, but lovely. What's cool about it, as young people say, is that half of the group must be people of color, and the activists are urged to contemplate not to network or to organize, just to contemplate. Everyone pitches in on the daily work, and the retreats are underwritten as part of movement building to assure broad access. Horseback riding, hiking, swimming, walking meditation, and healthy vegetarian food, no alcohol or caffeine, shape this spiritual experience for activists so we can refresh and equip ourselves for the ongoing struggles. Meditation is a welcome tool, but unlike some places where it's taught, at Vallecitos there's no infantilizing of students, no violent practices of stern teachers with power over newcomers, just an egalitarian community in which the power of contemplation is cultivated for the good of social change. Still more examples of the kind of spirituality I'm talking about come from individuals like feminist theorist Carol J. Adams, whose new book, The Inner Art of Vegetarianism, Spiritual Practices for Body and Soul, forms a bookend with her enduring book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. After making a strong case for the interconnection between feminism and vegetarianism, women's well-being and that of animals, she now pays attention to diet, exercise, and yoga. The globalized commodifications of food and the pornographic ways in which we conceptualize everything from a side of beef to a satiny whiskey, she argues, are rejected by choices we make by, about consumption. It makes for a spiritual challenge to live coherently in this basic area of food, but Carol helps in these books with insights and even recipes. Another example is feminist psychotherapist Mary Lou Randor, who makes a similar move in her wonderful book, Animal Grace entering a spiritual relationship with our fellow creatures. Without backing off for an instant from her earlier work, Women's Psyche, Women's Spirit, The Reality of Relationships, Mary Lou Randor looks at animals as sources of spirituality. Our animal familiars, she says, are neither to be worn nor eaten, but are companions who are sources of grace. She pays particular attention in her work to the connection between violence against animals and domestic violence, training police and community officials to see the signals and to act on them. I look to leaders like Starhawk, a learned Jewish woman who turned pagan activist, who lives this combination of spirituality and social change with vigor. She chronicles in her new book, Webs of Power, Notes from the Global Uprising, the struggle against globalization and the roots of that struggle in spiritual I might add, feminist spiritual practices. These examples of what, might con what might, one might consider far afield, after all, meditation and animal rights have never been central to feminist theopolitical efforts. These are proof that the justice connections are possible and necessary, and I would add many. How much more so in the mainstream efforts of inclusive language and liturgy within Christian denomination Christian denomination styles of ministry and community building are these efforts. How much more in the mainstream? Several notable examples emerge here. For example, the Justice and Witness Ministry of the United Church of Christ is led by powerful women ministers, including Bernice Powell Jackson, Loie Powell, and Mari Castellanos. The Unitarian Universalist Service Social Justice Ministry is headed by Meg Riley. These strong feminists in institutional church settings, and many others like them, bring their faith commitments and their justice values to bear on issues like impending war, anti-racism work, the federal budget, and federal judgeships, 
reproductive rights, and gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender concerns. It's all of a piece. One exciting example of interreligious feminist work took place in October 2002 in Geneva, Switzerland, at the Global Peace Initiative of Women, where 500 delegates from 75 countries met for the first time as a corrective to the usual male-dominated peace conferences. Reports of this meeting reminded me of a similar project of which I've been a part, the U.S. Women's Interfaith Network of the Pluralism Project at Harvard University. Under the leadership of Diana Eck, we have met several times in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with the goal of strengthening networks of religious women to bring about social change. At the Geneva event, Indian and Pakistani women planned common projects. Israeli and, and Palestinian women had breakfast and heard firsthand one another's pain. I recall in Cambridge last spring, after a particularly difficult session, that Jewish and Arab women sat down to have lunch together. They were overheard in the privacy of their shared meal after saying, please pass the salt. They were overheard saying, what do you want me to do? Imagine Ariel Sharon and Yasser Arafat, George Bush and Saddam Hussein approximating such behavior. And you begin to see, it's hard to imagine, and I'd say impossible, but you begin to see the importance of connecting feminist spiritualities and justice making. We have few other options and an urgency to use the resources we have created as feminist religious agents wisely. I rejoice that our efforts have produced such results and have confidence that we can do lots more. The challenges we face are as concrete as war itself. The women in Geneva proclaimed November 3rd, 2002 as Worldwide Day of Prayer for Peace. It's envisioned as a day when women religious leaders will don and distribute to their congregations white ribbons as symbols of a commitment that religion should never be used to promote violence or serve any nation's interests. It's a timely gesture, one that corresponds with the trajectory I'm encouraging. I find the challenges of the day best articulated in a set of questions, including, but not limited, to the ones I will now name. First, how does my practice, my congregation, my community prioritize women and those who've been marginalized, taking seriously their insights for both spiritual and practical matters? Minus this starting point, the most basic feminist insight ever, I see little hope for progress. Second, does my spiritual practice and the group with which I'm engaged in it encourage resource sharing so that my spiritual practice is consistent with other values I hold? This goes for churches and synagogues, as well as for small-based communities. Otherwise, the risk of bifurcation runs deep and religious values can be left aside in the marketplace. Third, does my spirituality provide me, provide for me, a warm welcome contrast to daily activity, such that it refreshes me and gives me energy for the work of social change? This essential ingredient acknowledges that spirituality is not politics, that prayer is not poetry, that a spiritual community is not a health club, though they may all have similar features. Attention to these differences can help the twain to meet and also offer the soul bathing that is a human right. Fourth, does my practice and my group reflect the diversity of people and concerns I hold? The most segregated hour of the week remains Sunday at 11 a.m., but I fear that many predominantly white feminist groups are no better any anti-racism work and attention to economic sharing must be part of a spiritual commitment. These are the best antidotes to the problem. And the last question, does my practice or my group point beyond itself to a larger reality of suffering and inequality so that even in the process of prayer and meditation, I'm contributing to social change and not simply fleeing its difficulty? I suspect that this will be one of the most challenging for those of us who've been nurtured in a mystical or contemplative tradition. Yet it's the example of Benedictines who pray ceaselessly for world peace, 
and Tibetan monks who spend their lives chanting for a nuclear free world can compel me to think that this is possible. In this look at social justice connections in feminist spiritualities, I've tried to point out that the very growth of the field from the days of Pat Reef's feminist spirituality to the many expressions that are now abroad is reason to celebrate, celebrate women's religious and social efforts. And in fact, to celebrate in a special way women's religious and social justice agency. But I caution against doing so prematurely if the expressions do not have an explicit justice connection. I've suggested that because we live in a fundamentally unjust society now at the brink of war, the need for such links is more critical and urgent than ever. I've mentioned some hopeful examples, and I've raised some questions to consider when evaluating one's own and one's community's practices. In so doing, I have alerted people to some of the dangers and at the same time, hopefully, enticed people, really enticed people, to rethink what postmodern feminist spiritualities might contribute to a troubled world. I'm confident that Pat Reef is urging us on. Thank you very much.